Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education and this is the Right to Read Initiative and School Level Change. Today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Pamela Snow join me to discuss how we can help create that school level change and understand the difficulties along the way because this isn't something that can be done overnight. So. Pam, would you take a moment and just tell us about who you are and what you've done in relation to this? Sure. Thank you, Catherine. And hello, everyone. It's good morning from me here in Australia, but it's good afternoon to um, those of you who are on, uh, in, the, in North America. Um, so I'm a professor of cognitive psychology in the School of Education at La Trobe University. I'm based at the Bendigo campus of La Trobe, which is a couple of hours north of Melbourne. Um, the main university campus is in Melbourne, but we have a, a big presence here in regional Victoria in Bendigo. By background, I'm a speech pathologist, speech language pathologist. I'm also a registered psychologist. My area of interest um, is um, reading um, instruction, high quality reading instruction, knowledge translation, getting the knowledge off the shelves of journal articles and into teachers' hands in um, classrooms. And with my colleague, Associate Professor Tanya Siri, I established the Science of Language and Reading or Solar Lab in the School of Education just on two years ago. Yeah, that's wonderful. And you've got a lot of great publications and a wonderful blog that has great posts. And actually, recently, uh, you had one discussing the shift from balanced literacy to a structured literacy approach. And that mm -hmm. came out two days before the Ontario Human Rights Commission Right to Read initiative came out. Mm -hmm. And in that report, they had several recommendations for how to improve reading instruction for our students. Now, while this report was done in Ontario and looked at the Ontario education system, it can be applied on a more global scale because best practices for teaching reading are not exclusive to Ontario. And the recommendations made in the report really help serve as a guide for other areas to improve their reading instruction. Mm, absolutely. And that, that timing was quite coincidental, really. Um, that, that's a blog that I'd been chipping away at uh, for quite some time in a stop start kind of fashion. And it just so happened that when I published it, it was just on the heels of the release of your Ontario Right to Read report. Um, but, but you're right, it's one thing to make recommendations and then something else altogether for schools, for school leaders, for literacy leaders, for classroom teachers to say, okay, what does this mean? And how are we going to turn around this ocean liner of ours um, that is reading instruction and, and everything else, writing and spelling. I mean, we, we talk about reading instruction, I guess, as an umbrella that obviously has a number of other components sitting underneath it. And of course, we're thinking about vocabulary and comprehension and fluency, you know, it's, it's a big complex space. But how do we go about this seemingly daunting process of actually changing the way we're doing things when we're pretty comfortable and embedded um, in, um, in, a, in a groove? Um, that for all intents and purposes seems to work okay. And, and we all need to acknowledge um, that balanced literacy works for some students. You know, we don't know the exact proportion. I would argue that all students stand to benefit from more explicit teaching about the nature of their writing system, um, how words work, the structure of words, um, what the relationship is between spelling and word structure, all of those things that go along with highly knowledgeable teachers who are able to teach explicitly. Um, but if balanced literacy didn't work for any children, then, you know, I think it's fair to say that it would have been, um, we would have moved on from it a long time ago. The fact that it seems to work for 
a significant, I would say definitely not enough proportion of students or work well enough means that the forces of homeostasis work in its favour. Homeostasis is that set of forces that maintains the status quo. And the status quo is important for all of us in many aspects of our lives. Yeah, it keeps us in the comfort zone. And I want to paraphrase a bit from that blog post. We'll share it uh, underneath in the replay so people can access it if they want to reference it. But you said that balanced literacy is a poorly defined system that promotes eclecticism, eclecticism, and it's not premised on a theory of reading that is testable. It's promoting that psycholinguistic guessing game related mm -hmm. to the whole language approach. Now, I don't know about those of you that are out there listening, but I don't want a hodgepodge of reading instruction for my students. It's one thing to have that eclectic furniture in your home and, uh, you know, in your cutlery drawer or in your cupboards, but mm -hmm. when it comes to something so crucial as reading instruction and we need to make sure that our students are getting what they need to succeed. And there is a method to the madness so that mm. teachers know what to expect with their students coming into the grade and have an understanding of what they're expected to cover in the grade instead of some general ideas. We need to make it more explicit in nature saying these are the mm. skills we are expecting our students to know at this grade level. Mm, I agree completely. And I think that problem of eclecticism uh, is uh, that, that really for me is a defining feature of balanced literacy. And if you read the balanced literacy literature, that's a word that comes up a lot. And it comes up as a positive feature by people who are um, promoting balanced literacy. So that's seen as a positive, that it is eclectic, that teachers can do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but there's no sense of scope and sequence, nothing structured coming from a position of deep knowledge about the nature of the English writing system and what we need to do to take a child from novice to proficient, if you like, expert for, for what an expert should be by, say, grade three after three years of, um, or grade two after three years of formal instruction. Um, so, so balanced literacy doesn't privilege that level of background knowledge that I think belongs to teachers. I feel very passionate about this, that there's a, a rich body of knowledge about the nature of the English writing system, the history of the English writing system, how we came to have the language that we call English today that in fact didn't originate in the country that we call England today um, and when people understand where our language comes from it's his, and, and particularly where the, um, the writing conventions come from for the, the rich array of languages that are represented in that thing that we call English then teachers in a, are in a much better position to teach with confidence um, how the writing system works and to do that in a way that's efficient um, so that our novices who come to school, you know, say around age five with to varying degrees, but with oral language skills, five years of oral language skills um, uh, under their belts. Yes, there's, there's variability and we can talk about that another day. But oral language, I always say, gets up earlier than um, reading skills. It gets up earlier in two ways, in a developmental sense for individual children, because oral language starts developing from birth, probably pre-birth, strictly speaking, in terms of um, voice recognition and so forth. Um, it also gets up earlier for us as a species in an evolutionary sense. So we, we've been doing oral language for a lot longer than we've been doing reading, writing and spelling as humans. 
So that means that we're dealing with something that, uh, as um, psychologist David Geary um, describes, is biologically secondary for us to do. It's not a natural thing for us to be doing. And that's been another fallacy of balanced literacy and its whole language heritage, that reading is natural, like oral language is natural. And if we just immerse children in enough text and make it pleasurable and enjoyable, that they're going to intuit how the writing system works. And the work of neurobiologists such as Stanislas Dehaene, I think, really helps us understand that uh, we're not born with a reading brain. Um, we're, we're born with a language brain, but something very specific needs to happen in the first three years of school in order for children to um, modify their language brain or have their language brain modified for them to become a reading brain. And I think what we're starting to see is a mainly ground up. Uh, I mean, what's happened in, top, in Ontario recently is very um, affirming and gives us cause for optimism around some of that perhaps starting to be a bit more top down. <clears throat> but many, many schools, many teachers are seeing for themselves, um, whilst they might not be thinking um, in terms of biologically primary, biologically secondary skills, they might not be thinking about a reading brain versus a language brain. What they're seeing in real time in front of them is that a significant proportion of children are not getting across that bridge from oral language in the first five years of life to reading, writing and spelling. And, that, and that's a bridge that has to be traversed in the first three years of school, where there's that big focus on learning to read so that they can get on the reading to learn bus um, that, that really is going to take off uh, for the children who are on the other side. For the children who are stuck on the bridge, of course, then we see the Matthew effect kick in and the, the, the gaps um, widen. So what I'm seeing here in Australia, and I suspect you're seeing a lot of in um, Canada and in North America, is that that, um, that urge for change and sense of urgency for change is, is occurring through communities of practice, through um, Facebook groups, um, other online platforms. But teachers are identifying that there is a different way of approaching reading instruction, but it's very different and, and hence the challenges associated with change. Yeah, and I just want to jump back to that biologically secondary yep. concept and that basically means that our brain is not pre-wired for reading correct and we do need to actually form connections between three different areas of our brain to get to that automaticity level so that we can read and recognize a word without effort and that's right. the goal and until we get there fluency and comprehension are going to be affected yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And explicit teaching of correspondences between phonemes and graphemes, explicit teaching of the writing code, practice. Um, we look at Linnea Aries' work on orthographic mapping, um, you know, how, how we, we get words to become orthographically mapped for children to promote that automaticity and fluency, which, as you say, are so important for comprehension. And then what we want to see, um, particularly by about um, grade three, is, oh, sorry, uh, yes, grade three, um, is children uh, proficient, um, sufficiently proficient with independent reading that they're also motivated to read and uh, acquiring new vocabulary through their own reading and being exposed to increasingly complex sentence structures through their own reading. But in order to get the vast majority of children to that point, we need to be using highly explicit and structured teaching methods from the outset so that we're not leaving children behind and then bringing out that so-called good China of explicit systematic instruction 
for the children who we've waited to allow them to fail, to, to struggle. And we shouldn't be talking about children failing in this sense. It's really instruction letting children down. Um, but then we're forever playing catch up. If, if we haven't got them to that point, and then we see the year three slump. And I, I think, you know, going back to the idea of change, what I'm seeing is schools that are, are just saying, look, we've had enough. Um, you know, our data is telling us that we have to do something different. We're not going to be sent different students next year. Um, it's the instruction that needs to change in order to make a difference in student outcomes. Yeah, and it's understanding that, you know, there are definitely individuals or students that do have a specific learning disorder. <laughs> Correct. But the population of students that are currently struggling with literacy, whether it's reading, writing, spelling, uh, are not all individuals who have a specific learning disorder. They also have the instructional casualties that Correct. are not able to learn how to read using that balanced literacy approach. But if at the beginning they were, you, were taught using a structured literacy approach, they would have not had any problems. Mm. So recognizing that if we employ a structured literacy, science of reading, whatever terminology you want to use for this evidence-based practice that is going on how the brain learns to read and develop those literacy skills, we need to make sure that that's part of it. So we are catching more students in that tier run Whole group instruction so we can really focus on the ones that do have a true learning disability or need that Absolutely. instruction. And if we think in response to intervention terms, we should be maximizing the quality and impact of what's happening at tier one. I don't know any schools that say, oh, we've got plenty of resources to um, mobilize for tier two and tier three. That's not a problem for us. That's a problem for every school. Um, but if we maximize the impact of tier one instruction, we will have fewer students requiring tier two support, let alone tier three support. And our resources can be really focused on those students. Remembering too, and um, you know, I'm certainly hearing this anecdotally, and it'll be good when we get to the point of being able to document this at a larger scale, that response to intervention is not just about academic support and academic achievement, it's also about positive behaviour support. And what school leaders are telling me um, where schools have um, gone about this three to five year process of change, and it, that's really how long schools need to commit, um, that they've seen a dramatic reduction in behaviour incidents and behaviour notifications that they're seeing much more on task behavior by children in classrooms and te all teachers know that it's that low level off task behavior that is so time consuming and, and distracting in classrooms. It's not necessarily major behavior incidents. But what's being reported to us is that the, the, um, there's a significant shift in on task behavior, particularly for children who perhaps previously would have been in the tail of the curve in terms of reading instruction for a range of psychosocial reasons, but now they're getting across that bridge and engaging academically and succeeding and feeling that positive self-esteem um, that goes with academic achievement. So, you know, th this has enormous potential benefits for, for schools and for communities in terms of students' sense of belonging and well-being at school. And academic achievement is a significant contributor to um, child and adolescent mental health. So this is not just about... Um, reading scores and writing and spelling, it's about young people's well-being. And if you look at um, underperforming adolescents, 
you see a really complex melting pot of mental health issues, school refusal, anxiety, um, a whole lot of complex issues in play that make it really hard to get to the reading issues because there's so much else going on, shame, embarrassment, um, resistance to anything connected to school. So we, we should be taking a preventative approach um, to those complex downstream problems. It's not my expression, but I often quote the expression that we should be building fences at the top of the cliff and not parking ambulances down the bottom. And high, highly efficient, structured, engaging, fast-paced, early um, reading instruction is all about building fences at the top of the cliff and not parking expensive and often ineffective ambulances at the bottom. Yeah, so what we really need to focus on is the teacher training, teacher education, professional development. And so we can strengthen that teacher knowledge and understanding best practices and even the language itself. At least up here in Canada, most teacher training programs require a couple uh, university level English courses, but these courses are more focusing on, on writing and great literary works, not necessarily focusing on the actual structure of the language and why mm. English is, mm. you know, orthographically so complex, how it's a morpheme phonemic language. Many yes. haven't even heard the word phoneme in Correct. their education program and get confused between the phonemes and the phonology and the phonics and the phonetics, yep. which is understandable. If you don't have the exposure to that knowledge, it can be very confusing and intimidating, but we need to create a safe place for teachers and educators within the system to say, look, we recognize that this is a big shift and it takes for a lot for you to come up and admit that you don't understand this. And we appreciate that you're in a situation where you can do that. And it makes you very vulnerable, but we applaud you for willing to make that change. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of support out there. Um, at La Trobe, um, since September 2020, my colleague Tanya Seri and I have been running online short courses for teachers um, to introduce them to the science of language and reading. And one of our, our introductory short course has a quite a focus on um, that sort of basic linguistics that teachers need to understand. You've talked about phonemes and graphemes. Uh, I mean, the idea of the schwa vowel just completely, on the one hand, blows people's minds, but on the other hand, it just creates so many aha moments in terms of why spelling and um, why um, supporting students with spelling can be so difficult if you don't understand the role that a schwa vowel plays in the pronunciation of a word. Uh, and of course, you know, we're, we're drawing on how we say a word when we try to spell it. Um, but if we understand about the schwa vowel, that makes a whole lot of lights go on. Um, and as you say, the fact that English is a morphophonemic language, what, what, what does that mean for how we think about words in our language and, and how we analyse words in our language? So we, we feel like we're um, providing to teachers what they really should have received in their teacher pre-service education. And that's very much the theme of the feedback that we get. We've had nearly 5,000 participants through our short courses now in 18 months. And the single strong, um, consistent, most consistent theme in the feedback is this is tremendously helpful and it's a game changer for my classroom practice, but I'm so angry that I didn't learn this in my pre-service teacher preparation. Um, so we, we are definitely changing that at La Trobe, but I, and I'd like to say that we're, um, you know, one of many universities in Australia that are doing so. We're not. Um, there is still sector-wide resistance and uh, I would say uh, a sector-level um, 
ongoing commitment to balanced literacy and a, and a belief in balanced literacy because I think balanced literacy and um, I'm going to use a term that some people won't like, but I'm going to call it fluffy pre-service teacher preparation. I think they collude with each other. They make each other feel comfortable. And we actually need to create a level of discomfort with, uh, around the knowledge that teachers need um, and accept that we have to be explicitly teaching to pre-service teachers this knowledge about how the writing system works so that they can take that into their classrooms. So that means universities need to have academics as part of their teams who are equipped to, to teach that content. Um, so I think there are lots of factors that, um, again, maintain the status quo um, at university level um, and, and that needs to be disrupted as well. Yes, of course. And we also need to, you know, emphasize that there is not one nicely, neatly packaged box program that they can just buy and implement. It's a matter of changing the teacher's understanding about how, you know, for example, reading works. It's understanding the simple view of reading. It's understanding Scarborough's reading rope and unpacking all of the strands. I don't know who to credit for the writing rope, but it's a similar thing. Yes, yes, absolutely. And that name isn't coming to mind. I see Lynn Stones with us. Lynn will know who, um, who gave us the writing rope. She can hopefully put that in the, um, in the chat. Um, yes, and I consider this to be the, the precious family china that needs to belong to teachers. If I walk into a school, I want to know that the most knowledgeable person, thank you, <laughs> um, I'm not very good at um, doing more than one thing at once like most humans, I guess. Um, but when I walk into a school, I want to know that the most knowledgeable person about everything to do with reading is a teacher. I don't want to be looking for a speech language pathologist or an educational and developmental psychologist if I want to talk about reading. I, I want to be talking to really knowledgeable teachers who challenge me and question me and say, but, you know, have you seen um, the recent work of so-and-so that they've been exposed to via a, a, a Facebook group? Um, th this is the precious family China that we have to um, give to teachers in their teacher pre-service education. Many teachers are sourcing this precious knowledge for themselves through Facebook groups, through professional learning, short courses, um, but... Uh, and they, they shouldn't have to do that. Professional learning should be about ongoing building and refinement of knowledge. We don't um, teach medical students information that was 50 years out of date um, 30 years ago about how to manage infections, for example, and let them work out for themselves after they graduate that there's much better ways of managing infections or triaging people who have chest pain when they turn up in the emergency department. We make sure that we give them the best available knowledge now. Now, while I'm on analogies with health professionals, sometimes people say, but teachers are professionals, you should let them make their own decisions about the children in their classroom. And there's an assumption that people in other professions like medicine, nursing, allied health, psychology, get to make their own decisions because they're professionals. And that's a fallacy. Um, the example I often use is of people going to the emergency department with chest pain. You'll be triaged by somebody who is following a very strict protocol um, that tells them what investigations you're going to have based on your presenting symptoms. You're going to get an ECG. You're going to get some bloods done. There are things that are going to happen irrespective of who it is that's triaging you because they're following a strict care pathway, a scope and sequence, if you like. So the idea that professionals get to just make stuff up for themselves is a complete anathema in, to my mind of what it means to be a, prof a professional. A professional for me is someone who uh, has highly constrained levels of accountability around the way that they practice. 
and they're not getting these scope and sequences or procedures from doctors pay doctors no exactly or pinterest or TikTok. no exactly and we would be horrified if they were yeah so any change that we're advocating for really needs to start at a foundation of providing teachers with this knowledge because i know at least from my experience so many times when we go in that research setting trying to implement a program where they've had a you know a one or two day professional development on it we don't necessarily see the implementation fidelity when it comes to using that program or um, mm. that workbook we're seeing them take their interpretation and not providing the support that they need to do it well we're not giving them that resource to reach out and say look i know you covered this but how am I supposed to do this lesson? Like, how do I really do mm. this? And you want to make sure that there's somewhere to, they can go to get that knowledge, answer those questions and provide them that support in the classroom. Correct. And, and we need to recognise, and this is why we talk about this being really a three to five year journey for schools that stay the course, that there are lots of little landmines and tripwires out there and teacher knowledge um, provides one of those because uh, this can be quite a knowledge journey for, for teachers moving away from whole language balanced literacy and many of the um, pieces of pseudoscience that attach themselves to those methodologies. Um, uh, so, so filling the knowledge gap is one thing, but the, the practice and implementation side of things is another thing altogether. And I see this um, sometimes when I go into classrooms, teachers inadvertently employing strategies that are quite hardwired into their practice that are actually um, balanced literacy whole language approaches. Um, so a child gets to an unfamiliar word and the teacher you know, inadvertently says, oh, well, what kind of word could work there? Um, even though they've been teaching systematic synthetic phonics, they sometimes momentarily forget that the information that the student needs is right in front of them in the text and they need to encourage the student to be using their decoding skills and decoding through the word. So fidelity is a, a major problem, as is the phenomenon whereby schools put their toe in the water, um, they, um, they may be download a few different things, go to a little bit of professional learning, try a few things, do that in a maybe not terribly systematic way in their enthusiasm to get change, but then they don't see the change that they're hoping for, either because they haven't waited long enough or because there's been some lumpiness in the implementation. And then they say, oh, we tried that and it didn't work. Um, so uh, where, where they can, I think, uh, working with a coach who can work shoulder to shoulder with them, and that's what Tanya and I do in the schools that we work with, we're there to learn, we're there to understand the complexities of the classroom, which are many and varied, as this audience will know. Um, but we're also there to say, hmm, have you considered when you do this, um, maybe doing it this way, or you know, can, can we talk? about what, you know, what happened there, whether we're looking at videos or whether we're talking about what we're observing in real time in the classroom. But, but, but those relationships rely on the establishment of a lot of trust um, and a shared sense of problem solving, um, that, you know, that we're on a journey together, we're wanting to understand things together, um, and we're wanting to make the practice that's occurring in the classrooms more consistent and more aligned to something that we might generally call the science of reading structured explicit reading instruction and not be having those vestiges of whole language and balanced literacy instruction that can creep in <coughs> excuse me exactly and another big part of this 
whether it's a movement or theory, however you want to term it, is making sure that we have screening frequently amongst the grades. And it's important to highlight the screening is not to diagnose the students with anything. It's purely highlighting where they're at and what skills they need to work on and mm. then employing strategies to help support, support their learning using data-driven assessments. Correct. And um, data, data um, um, that teachers understand, that teachers can interpret and can use today in their classroom practice. And that's why I'm an advocate of, for example, the phonics screening check done at the right time. Um, so we've given students enough time to learn the things that we think that we're teaching them. But it tells us sometimes in quite confronting ways that what we think we're teaching and what students are actually learning can be two different things. Um, and, and that's why I'm not a fan of something like a running record, um, which uh, has poor validity, poor reliability, doesn't tell teachers um, what they really need to know. And what teachers tell me is that over the years, they've done hundreds and thousands of running records, but it hasn't changed what they do in the classroom. So we need to be equipping teachers with accessible, quick, valid and reliable progress monitoring tools that have early warning systems built into them, like the phonics screening check does, um, so that we can then use that RTI framework for differentiation, work out who needs extra time on some important core skills. Um, and sometimes teachers say, oh, you know, I've done, I've done lots of phonics with this child, but um, he or she still can't blend through the word. And my response to that is that, that that child almost certainly needs more practice, more repetitions, more opportunities for mastery. They don't need something different. They haven't learned how to do it yet. Um, and, and there can be a bit of a tendency to think, well, that didn't work. I've got to bail and do something different. And then we're giving our weakest readers very confusing messages about what the reading process is. So it is important that we stay with approaches that we know are going to get students there if we give them sufficient practice and opportunities for mastery. Yeah, and you know, especially when we're working with kids that do have a legitimate specific learning disorder such as dyslexia, the number of repeated exposures needed for them to grasp a score, a skill could be hundreds or even thousands if mm. it's getting that word mapped. So mm. it's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's not saying, okay, well, we're going to forget that. We're going to, you know, look at the pictures or something. Yeah. That's not the thing. It's understanding that they need that repeated explicit instruction to build the automaticity. And it's just going to take longer given their profile. Correct, correct. And all the while we need to be maintaining students' motivation and self-esteem in relation to reading and finding small wins and celebrating successes along the way to, to keep them with us on this journey. Um, and anyone who works with struggling readers will know that that relational component is so important. Um, and, and to be really focusing on the wins and the achievements and helping them to see how far they've come um, because we, we want every child, every student to be a reader, a writer and a speller and want to take away as many barriers as we can. I'm a big fan of um, the writing. I can send you a link um, to this, Catherine, if you'd like um, to share it um, afterwards, the writings of an Australian um, education researcher, the late David Corson, who referred to the lexical bar, and that's the, the, the notional distance between what Isabel Beck and her colleagues would refer to as tier one words and tier two, tier three words that, particularly tier two words that are used by more literate language users and, of course, turn up in books that children are required to read and engage with at school at primary and secondary levels. 
um, many of those tier two words came into English um, after the Norman invasion. So many of them have come from Latin via French. And then there was a big push, as um, many people will know, of words of Latin and Greek um, origin into the English language in the Age of Enlightenment and the Renaissance. So more scholarly language is that higher order, higher tier language that students who are not reading are just not getting exposed to. Um, so again, we've got the Matthew principle kicking in. Um, you know, th this is not just about decoding. A high quality, explicit um, reading instruction is about decoding in the early stages, but it, that's to take decoding away as a barrier to access to the richness of the English language and the, the access to the more literate language that students are going to need to be reading and using in order to succeed as they move up through the year levels. Um, and uh, Corson talked about the, you know, the lexical bar being a, you know, a metaphorical bar that students need to get across if they're going to succeed academically. Definitely. And getting across that bar means that these students are able to orthographically map these words in an efficient manner after only a few exposures instead of those right. several exposures because it, it's too hard and too onerous and they're not going to be coming across these words as frequently. That's right. That's right. Their the number, uh, I mean, by, by definition, tier two words are not coming up as often as tier one everyday um, words that in many cases children acquire in the preschool years. Um, but that's, that's, that'll suffice to a large extent for everyday conversations and schoolyard interactions and so forth it won't suffice to succeed academically. And, it, and again, that gap between the haves and the have nots is very, very obvious in the writing of um, students as they progress through their year levels, because we can see um, the use of much more basic vocabulary in the writing of the weaker students. And also, of course, a much poorer grasp of sentence structure um, in that in that writing and of course you know all of all of what we're talking about in terms of change processes relates also to the teaching of writing just as much as it does um, to the teaching of reading and I, I work with teachers who um, you know it's, it's really embarrassing for them to have to say we want to be teaching students to write better sentences and we don't know what a sentence is now, teachers shouldn't have to say that, you know, we, we, doctors don't have to sit around with a coach and say, well, you know, I, I don't know what an infection is. I, I'd, I'd treat them better if I knew what infection was, but I don't know what infection is. So I just think it's so unfair on teachers that they, they have to have that almost embarrassing moment of confession to say, you know, we want our students to write better, but, but we need to understand sentence structure first. We, we don't know what a phrase is. We don't know what a clause is. Um, so, I mean, and, and I'm happy to um, work with teachers at that level, but I do think that they've been sold short in their pre-service education. And, you know, going back to the idea of change, that makes the hill a lot steeper um, for schools that, do say, yes, we're going to do this, you know, it's not surprising that not all journeys are completed because it is a steep hill that um, teachers and schools are asking themselves to climb when they undertake this change process. It's worth it. The view is fabulous when you get to the top of the hill, but it's a steep climb and it's a precarious climb. Well, and the thing is, the problem for the in-service teachers is this has to happen while they are still teaching, while they still have all their other Correct. responsibilities. They aren't in a situation where they're attending university and explicitly focusing on learning how to teach. They are already teaching. They have their full class responsibilities. So we need to make sure that we make it in a way that is accessible to them that's not Correct. added 
expense financially. I mean, there are great courses out there, but it is a huge investment for teachers who already are pouring so much money and time into their classrooms and into their students. Mm. And it's, it's a big ask. And it's something that we need to make sure going forward doesn't happen. But we have to deal with where we're currently at. Correct. And we also need to acknowledge, I think, Catherine, that some teachers are doing this um, in isolation um, because they don't have the support of their colleagues. And sometimes we're talking about quite junior teachers who experience significant pushback from school leaders. And they so they don't have that sense of a community of practice around them. Um, you know, so, sometimes um, they're changing practice in their classrooms almost um, in secret um, and, and almost having to conceal what they're doing. And they're also working in contexts where their resources don't support the approach that they're taking. So where they would love to have decodable or phonically controlled texts available for early reading instruction. Instead, they've got sets of level predictable readers that work against um, the way that they're trying to teach with a scope and sequence in mind. So... Um, I have nothing but um, a sense of awe and humility for those teachers who trailblaze in their schools and um, who over time sometimes let their data speak for itself. Um, but still some people are not convinced by data. So, you know, if you can't change people's minds um, with data, and I've seen instances where that happens, it, it's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, something that was brought up in the comments is a lot of the teacher education programs are at mercy to the curriculum for the province. True. And that's that applies in Australia to some extent as well. Um, and we're probably similar in Australia to Canada in terms of our systems of government and the fact that we've got a series of states and territories. Mm -hmm. And for us, um, education is mainly a state level or province level um, responsibility. Um, but but I, I think there needs to be a hard conversation about who's the tail and who's the dog, um, because the um, you know other disciplines manage to get this right. Medicine gets it right. Nursing gets it right. Psychology gets it right. You know we we, we don't hear of these tensions in other disciplines. Um, it seems to be. I mean I'm sure they have their niggles. Um, but not, not at the level of the discourse that we hear in relation to education because there has been undoubtedly a massive knowledge translation failure. It horrifies me that um, I, I used to give some guest lectures to education students before I moved into my current role in a school of education and they were fourth year students, so final year, about to go out into classrooms. And I always used to do a bit of a straw poll and say, um, uh, how many of you know that we had a national inquiry into the teaching of literacy in Australia in 2005? Blank faces. I've never had a hand go up. Now, if we had a national inquiry um, into high rates of perinatal um, mortality, I think we'd be telling medical students about that. And in fact, we did have a terrible scenario here in Victoria a few years ago where one of our rural hospitals did have an unacceptably high rate of stillbirth and perinatal deaths. And there was an inquiry and the findings of that inquiry were sh shared far and wide so that everybody knows and that horror is not repeated. But why were pre-service teachers not being told that reading is contested? So they weren't even being told balanced literacy, but not everybody agrees with balanced literacy. They were being taught the way that you teach children how to read is via balanced literacy as a matter of fact. And, and I think we, we do pre-service teachers a great disservice. And that's the, I don't think that's intellectually honest for universities to be doing that. Universities should be about debating ideas and teaching its graduates how to debate ideas. 
Right, for sure. Now, there's a couple points that I want to hit in this conversation before we go to some of the questions, because there are some great questions coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is our, our topic started out with school level change, but I think it's understanding that it's not just changing at the school level. There are higher levels and lower levels that we need to do this. And Another thing that you mentioned in that post is that change is a process that's difficult to initiate and to explain. So- Or oh, to maintain, I think sorry, I said. I probably wrote it down wrong. Yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> sorry, mad notes uh, right before. Right. Anyways, let's talk about those three things that you highlighted. Uh, looking at the vulnerability that increases the likelihood of relapse. So I think that was talking about, you know, the implementation fidelity, yep. right? So if teachers aren't using these new skills and new instructional approaches effectively, then mm. they're going to say, okay, well, it's not working. Mm. So I'm not going to use it. Yep, exactly. And when we're new to a space, we don't know what we don't know. And we can think that we have understood something and that we're implementing it correctly. Um, but in fact, there might be some near misses in what we're doing. And that's where I think team teaching uh, can be really important. And I've certainly sat with groups of teachers when we've been discussing different pedagogical approaches and they've looked at each other and scans and said, oh, is that what you do? I, I do that completely differently. So team teaching um, and uh, working with a coach taking video samples of small snippets of classroom practice that can then be discussed in a, uh, a safe um, community of practice context. What went well here? You know, what, what could you have done differently? Um, what did you notice when you did that? Um, so fidelity um, to the change process is incredibly important. It takes a long time to get the root system established. And, and I guess, you know, it, it just as when you um, plant something new in your garden, it often doesn't grow very much on the surface, let alone flower, until it's got an established root system. So we really need to spend time on getting the root system of this different way of teaching established. And we do that through teacher knowledge and change practice, but it does take time. And there are going to be bumps along the way. So, Absolutely. as you said, again, we need to be deliberate in our actions so that we have that support network in place to protect and sustain the changes that have been made. And understanding that there are materials that we're just going to have to say, yes, we've spent tens of thousands of dollars on these, but we can't use them. And it's a learning experience. Mm. We're not going to continue to make that mistake. Correct. And in many cases, you know, when we're talking about sets of level readers, which are very expensive for schools to purchase, most of them can be put into school collections in, you know, where they can become part of classroom collections of books that children can read when they're proficient at reading whatever they want to read. The very, very early ones I'd probably ditch in most cases, but you know, I'm not a fan of throwing out books. I love books, um, but they, those very, very early ones um, that really do foster that habit of reciting rather than reading, mm -hmm. I'd be losing those. But in, in most cases, books don't need to be um, discarded. But we need to get past that sunk cost fallacy. And I've worked with schools that have only just in the last, you know, six or 12 months spent a five-figure sum on investing in those um, sets of leveled readers. Because what we, what we don't want schools to do is to outsource how they teach reading to a commercial um, program how, how we teach reading needs to be something that comes from inside teachers' heads around their knowledge of um, the English language, spoken and written. And if we get that right, you know, um, 
butcher's paper, whiteboards, um, textures, whiteboard markers, um, you know, they, they are the materials. Obviously, it helps to have some appropriate um, text for children to be reading. But, you know, this is not a resource intensive space um, if we invest in the knowledge of the teachers. We don't have to have lots of expensive bells and whistles around us. We do need to invest in teacher knowledge, however. And that's going to allow you to adapt to the student, individual students' needs. A lot of these expensive intervention programs may have a little bit of individualizations, but they don't have all of the options able to specifically target the students' needs and adapt as needed. Yes. Uh, correct and and that's where um, teachers sort of go back to feeling that they're flying blind a little bit and that their practice is being driven by a, a program like like most um, so-called reading scientists if you want to use a generic term I've got a, um, a mixed relationship with the idea of programs Louisa Motes remind us reminds us that um, programs don't teach children how to read teachers do but um, programs can be a very helpful scaffold for teachers who are early on this journey. Um, and I, I have no problem at all with teachers using a script in systematic synthetic phonics instruction. I've been in classrooms where they are following a script. They're, they're reading very obviously from a script. Kids don't care. They don't notice. Um, what, what they're doing is engaging with the fact that they're doing fast-paced learning um, and that they are actually learning learning new knowledge and skills. Um, what, what we don't want is teachers not investing in the new knowledge that they need to make a program really come to life. So if you've got a high quality program, it really helps, of course, to have high levels of teacher knowledge. You can buy a high quality program tomorrow Building your knowledge is going to take longer, um, but if you want if you want to do something tomorrow, certainly start with the program. But if you don't see the effects that you're hoping for, don't don't cheat that all home to the program. Um, you, that's where we need to have some conversations about, well, what was the level of fidelity in its implementation? What else were you doing? What we tend to see in the early stages of schools making a shift, and I was talking to a leadership team the other day who were in exactly this space. They've been teaching using systematic synthetic phonics, but they're reluctant to get let go of their level readers. And they were surprised that they've still got that, you know, cohort of the, the, the bottom sort of 30-ish percent of the curve who are really struggling, even though they're being taught SSP, because when they pick up a text, they, they're being asked to do something that they can't do because they haven't been taught. Um, and, and, and I said to them, look, you know, if you're looking for low hanging fruit here, um, that the low hanging fruit is to align the kinds of text that you're asking your beginning readers to read with what you've been teaching them and not ask them to do things that they haven't been taught to do that, that in many cases way exceed their ability. So it's quite common in my experience to see um, a bit of a potpourri occurring early on in the change process, that there's a willingness to do some things early and not other things. A little bit like when we're cleaning out our cupboards, um, there are things that we go, yep, that definitely needs to go. I've known for ages that needs to go. We look at other things and think that probably needs to go, but I just can't quite bear to part with it just yet. And of course, that's one of the, the things that we see often in schools on change journeys, that they adopt new practices, but they don't let go of old practices. In the same way that when we buy new plastic containers for the kitchen, we don't always get rid of the old ones that have got mismatched lids. If, you, if your drawers are anything like mine, <laughs> I shouldn't make assumptions um, about our listeners, but don't come and look in my plastic containers drawer. 
Yes, of course. And, you know, I want to highlight that there is learning that can happen during some of those programs that are purchased to work on skills. So while mm -hmm. the teacher is working through that scripted program, they're increasing their knowledge and their understanding of the concepts that are embedded in that program. And as they get use it and get to know it better, it's going to increase their knowledge and ability to go off script. Correct. And they're also seeing in real time how students respond to that kind of instruction. And what I hear often is, oh, my goodness, I had no idea five-year-olds could do the things that they're doing because we're teaching in this way for the very first time. So they're getting that immediate feedback, even though, and it must be acknowledged, when we teach children explicitly, piece by piece, how the code works, it takes longer to get them to a level of fluency that can be confected via um, the use of predictable texts very, very early on. So we, we, they are associated with a halo effect where um, you know, we know that children are actually reciting from those predictable texts, but they look like they're fluent readers. And of course, those children are like the souffles that collapse in the middle. Um, and that's that year three slump that we see when they can't actually decode when the text gets more complex and the pictures disappear. But we do need to acknowledge, and there's a wonderful episode of the, um, the Science of Reading podcast uh, where Margaret and Alana from the Right to Read project talk about their journey from balanced literacy to structured explicit science of reading instruction. And they talk about the fact that, you know, frankly, it's a little bit painful for teachers to sit and, you know, almost press their fingernails into their flesh when kids are really struggling and those cognitive cogs are grinding slowly as they're making connections between phonemes and graphemes. But when they get it, they get it in such a way that they've acquired transferable skills. They haven't learnt this sight word. They've learnt how to decode through a series of words, which means that they can decode, you know, hundreds if not thousands of words. So we're teaching a transferable skill, not an isolated skill. Yeah, and uh, one of the things mentioned in the recommendations of the Right to Read public inquiry was making sure that there's an established list of acceptable programs. And it's important to highlight uh, that many programs are a wolf in sheep's clothing, mm. where they're saying mm. that they are structured literacy or that they've made edits to their program to align with the science of the reading or such mm. structured literacy, but they don't have the facts straight Mm. And they're not putting enough emphasis on the areas that need it. Mm. Or and contain frank errors in some yeah. of their materials. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we, we have a, a list that I regard as um, a reliable source in that regard in Australia on the DSF website, the Dyslexia Spelled Foundation website. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if people go to that website and um, or if you search um, uh, phonics programs and DSF website, I can certainly find it for you if you can't find it Catherine but and they're not necessarily programs and approaches that have independent research done on them and we have to acknowledge that there's not a lot of money for research in this space and it's very difficult for people who develop high quality materials and programs to get independent research done I mean that's that's a, a, a very huge investment um, to, to do that. But what we're looking for is alignment with what we regard as contemporary scientific evidence about the nature of the reading process from a cognitive and linguistic perspective and what the current evidence tells us about optimal ways of teaching all children to read. So yes, you know, scientific research will always be changing and evolving and we'll be refining our understanding, but teachers have to go into their classroom today 
um, and need to know that all, all practices are not equal with respect to the likelihood that they will get all children across the bridge or the vast majority, 95% across the bridge in the first three years of school, thanks to high quality tier one instruction. So if this was a horse race, which is the horse that we're going to bet on as the likely winner, uh, recognising that, yes, okay, over time the form might change of the, of the horses and as the form changes, we'll change our practice. But teachers don't have the luxury of saying, okay, well, we'll just wait 10 years um, and, and see what the scientific evidence looks like then. They've got to do something now. And I think we need to ensure that teachers have the benefit probabilistically of what is likely to work for the majority of children, knowing that there will be some, as you say, who have a specific learning difficulty, a neurobiological barrier to learning how to read, and then we reserve our limited intervention resources for those students and um, create an impactful change to their skill levels. Yeah, and I think it's really important that the districts and the schools take the responsibility for providing these teachers with the materials that they need to succeed. Too mm. often teachers are spending their own hard earned after tax dollars on these programs. And that's a disservice to students because it depends on where the teacher is in mm. their knowledge of oh. this journey. Yeah, we don't ask nurses to buy antiseptic swabs um, for patients in the hospitals that they're looking after. Um, you know that that should not even be a discussion point. Uh, but I know that it does happen. I know I know teachers do do that, particularly when they're working in environments where they're not feeling supported to make this kind of change. Yeah. So one of the questions is a bit of a a long-winded one, but we'll go through it. It says, if the very expensive LLI programs, meaning many LLI kits that can reach many different readers, are LLI books as tier one supplemental resources for proficient readers for grade three and above, discouraged for use, it is explicit systematic instruction with a scope and sequence and can be easily uh, be improved by doing away with the three queuing system and educating teachers in structured literacy strategies that support readers in developing phonemic and phonetic awareness and breaking the code. These programs, though not deemed evidence-based, may address many of the parts of Scarborough's reading ropes uh, are addressed in these books. Please address this for grades three plus from someone who is trying to be creative with resources that they have in the building that students do not find engaging? I think that question has maxed out my working memory, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I would be very happy if that person would like to enter that as a question on my blog post. Um, and I'm happy to engage with it there. I think the, the summary is basically a teacher who's trying to re use the resources that they have available, which are the LLI programs, and wondering, you know, so these programs do address several of the components of the reading rope. Yes. But not everything. So yeah. how can we make it better for someone that's trying to use the resources that they have? Mm -hmm. I think that comes back to teacher knowledge. So a knowledgeable teacher um, and, you know, there's no limit to knowledge. So it's not like, you know, you have to um, do one online course and then you're considered knowledgeable. Knowledge is something that we all continue to acquire in this space and refine over time. Uh, knowledgeable teachers can use those resources and can repurpose those resources in ways that possibly look nothing like how they were intended um, to be used. And I'm fine with that if it's aligning with um, cognitive psychology principles and our understanding of um, reading science. But I think that's a big ask of um, teachers who are, in the early stages of this change process and are not confident 
in their knowledge about how the English writing system works and how speech and print um, map to each other and relate to each other. Um, so, yes, it's, it's possible to do, um, but not equally possible for all teachers, I would say. A huge time investment. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what we would prefer, of course, is to see um, a whole school approach um, to change. And certainly the schools that I work in that are taking a whole school approach, um, they start to see the flow on effects as cohorts move in, move up through their year levels. Um, there are lower order skills that are in place that are then not needing to be um, taught, retaught, retrofitted um, because they were addressed in the earlier years. Um, but, you know, it does take a while to get to that whole school approach. And sometimes it's a small group of teachers. Maybe it's often the early years teachers who initiate this change. And then other people come on board and also want to know more, but it really does take time. Yeah, and it's, you know, making sure the curriculum has that predefined scope and sequence that fits the developmental progression of students and learning to read so that you can go back with your screening measures and see what parts are missing for that student. Correct. Correct. Yep. Um, and, and again, employ principles of RTI um, so that we're identifying early and intervening early. Yeah. And so for those intermediate grades, so three through nine, when you're shifting the focus to comprehension, a lot of those interventions are focusing on the comprehension component and yes. not going back to the basic phonemic awareness and mm. phonics knowledge where mm. the student needs to have the support and the foundation built so that they can go then to focus on comprehension and fluency activities. And we can't assume, um, as I'm sure no one listening to this interview would, that a struggling year nine student has only um, language comprehension difficulties as the only barrier to their reading because, in my experience, many of those students have mastered what we might refer to as the simple code, um, but they haven't mastered the complex code. They don't know how to approach um, polysyllabic words. They know nothing about morphology. They can't use morphological cues to segment words into smaller, manageable, recognisable components to get them off the page, let alone understand um, what they mean. So in many cases, there are quite foundational skills that are lacking um, in those struggling older readers. And of course, they will have language comprehension gaps because they haven't been reading. Um, so they haven't been building their knowledge of language and their content knowledge, their background knowledge through reading. So when they pick up a text, they don't have so much background knowledge to bring to the topic of the text, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, and so they're going to struggle to understand it, even though, you know, in some cases at a sentence by sentence level, they might be okay, but they, they can't pull it all together um, and form a mental schema because of the gaps in their background knowledge. Yeah, well, and I think it's to, important to discuss. I, I know I'm going to get the specifics wrong, but I think it's about grade three or grade four where a proficient reader who's an avid reader will read more in three days, exposing themselves to the same amount of words that a poor reader is going to be exposed to in the entire academic year at school and outside of school. Yes, I've seen that, though, that statistic quoted as well and I'm not sure of the source of it um, but it certainly sounds plausible yeah, um, I, I have it written down somewhere it's just not in that long yes, yeah, that, yeah. unfortunately. Um, but it, it does really emphasize that the importance of that Matthew principle um, and the what might start off early on as a relatively narrow gap between students 
opens up quickly and widely to a big gap based on um, reading proficiency and the advantages that um, efficient, proficient reading confers versus the liability of not being a, a proficient, automatic, um, motivated reader. Yes, of course. Now, the next one is kind of an opinion one. Uh, I think I'll give my attempt at answering it. And then if you want to go in, uh, that we're putting all the responsibility for preparation at the university level. However, those basic grammar skills, like knowing what a sentence is, needs to start earlier than university in the K to 12 instruction. Responsibility lies there as well. Is that, uh, and they're like saying, right? And I say, of course it does but we can't change what has already happened. And with that whole balance literacy and whole language approach where they're using inventive spellings and not focusing on the, you know, the sentence structure and the proper writing formats, we can't go back and say, okay, well, go back to kindergarten and let's go through school again. Mm, you get exactly. that. I can think of a, a personal example where my husband went to school at a private school, a preparatory school, and then went away to university. And he actually had to do an English language test because he had scored a, a B instead of an A. Uh, and then when he went to university, he was actually the one that was editing his uh, peers' papers because they had that more relaxed approach to writing and they didn't know how to write a proper paragraph or mm. essay it wasn't there we can't replace what's been done before we can only move forward from today so while it would have been nice for them to have gotten it in their um you know their public education or their k-12 to mm. education mm. we have to realize that it's not there so we need to start from square one Absolutely. And we need to recognise too that our wholesale adoption, our uncritical, enthusiastic wholesale adoption of whole language come balanced literacy that occurred when, you know, we, we were like lemmings and just followed the United States, we in Australia, um, who just followed the United States uncritically um, into this space. We have now created an intergenerational problem that is going to take generations to turn around because our teaching workforce are themselves products of whole language balanced literacy classrooms. So teachers say to me, I wasn't taught this. I wasn't taught grammar. I wasn't taught what the components of a sentence are, what the features of a sentence are. Um, so how can we ask teachers to give what they do not have? That's another biblical reference in the um, reading literature, the, the, the Peter principle. We talk about the Matthew effect, but there's also the Peter effect of asking teachers to give, to teach something that they themselves do not have. So that was an unintended consequence, if you like, of, um, a, a, of that wholesale shift to, um, to whole language, to balanced literacy, to ripping out this teaching that I was fortunate to receive because I'm old enough and I just happened to come in at the tail end of that kind of instruction. But, you know, I was taught that stuff at school. It makes it easier there for me, to, for me to use it and it also makes it a bit easier for me to teach it, the fact that I was taught it. Um, and, you know, we, we see this all the time in first-year university students, not just first years, but it's really obvious in first years and not just in education. I hear this from professors in the law school, in the health faculty. Students do not have strong writing skills. They write in sentence fragments. Um, they use run-on sentences. They're writing as if they're speaking. So they haven't learnt that distinction, that register um, distinction between um, what we do when we're writing versus what we do when we're speaking. We're not aware of run-on sentences when we're speaking because spoken language is different from written language. And we've got this thing called punctuation that we need to use 
when we're writing. But that, that you know, that goes hand in hand with the idea of all of this being biologically secondary and unnatural and needing to be taught. And we stopped teaching it a long time ago and we are going to pay the price for decades for, for the folly of that decision of almost overnight taking this out and and now you know if if our federal government said to teachers tomorrow okay we've got the power and you have to teach this way even if they wanted to if the whole teaching workforce wanted to they can't because they don't have the knowledge and the understanding yes of course um, they were also wondering if you have any recommendations for teaching early, sorry, a course that teaches early writing. Early writing. Um, well, I, again, I'm going to um, mention my friend and colleague's name, Lynn Stone here, because uh, Lynn runs wonderful um, short courses on um, writing. Um, there was a report written recently that might be of interest to people. It was written by Amina McLean in her capacity as a researcher with AERO, the Australian Education Research Organisation, about um, the, the problems with writing instruction. So it's a sort of state of the nation around um, writing instruction that contains a number of recommendations, and I can provide the link um, to that. Um, but I, and, and many people would be familiar too with the writing revolution. I think... In a nutshell, what needs to happen with writing is that you know, certainly talking about what we do here, a common practice here is to ask five-year-olds on Monday morning to write a page about what they did on the weekend. And we need to stop doing that as a matter of priority and start teaching children what the characteristics of a sentence are and supporting them to write in sentences um, and to be, um, to be doing that to the point of mastery um, and so that they know about different sentence types, declarative sentences, questions, exclamations. They, they know how to use punctuation. They know about capitalisation. You know, I've got grade six teachers in one of the schools that I'm working in saying, oh, but, you know, they're still not using capital letters at the start of a sentence. Well, Anita Archer would say they haven't been taught to, if, if students are not doing something, that, that means they haven't been taught or it hasn't been reinforced, it hasn't been expected, it hasn't been required of them, it hasn't been taught to a level of automaticity and mastery. So I, I would say with writing, let's pair it right back for our beginners and get them mastering what a sentence is so that then we can build up um, from sentence to paragraph, you know, understanding about topic sentences in paragraphs, and then we can move to more macro structure of a piece of writing. But if you don't know what a sentence is and you don't know what subject verb agreement is, um, it, your, your writing is going to be messy and it's going to be frustrating for readers and, and you're never going to develop into a proficient writer you know it's it's like anything else you get the basics right and then you build up from there well and i think you know that journal activity that you had mentioned earlier it's another case of making sure that we're being explicit and systematic in our instruction of writing so when we're giving them that open-ended journal activity they especially in, you know in the kindergarten and the grade one they don't have the skills to necessarily sound out or uh, encode the words that they want to use in that practice. So we're asking them to do something that they don't have the skills to do. So we're setting them yeah. up for failure. Exactly. And we're setting them up to use a whole lot of invented spelling. Now, of course, beginners are going to use invented spelling because they're going to do the best that they can when they want to write something to get a word onto the page. But we don't want to be creating lots of opportunities for invented spelling so that they're, in a sense, creating neural pathways that support errors in spelling. Um, far better, I would say, to be getting children to be copying sentences off the whiteboard that the teacher has just written and to be doing that to the point of mastery um, before we're asking them to um, generate, you know, the, there's a big push for this sort of um, genre um, writing 
ahead of having the basic skills in place. Um, and it always worries me when I see, um, you know, young children, it's so effortful for them to get words on the page um, and they're getting words on the page in, you know, with, with as I said, lots of invented spelling, um, which is not always corrected, by the way. So they're not always told that that's not the correct way that you spell that word. So I, pedagogically, I just don't see that as a very um, good use of children's valuable time. And we do need to value children's instructional time. It's their time, not ours. Exactly. And there are exercises and activities that we can do to get them further on the way, along the way. While they don't have those encoding skills, we can still talk about it and discuss the sentence structure. Yep. Yep, working with sentence anagrams, you know, components of a sentence that are cut up and they have to organise them into the right order, read it and then write it. That's a useful activity for our very early beginners rather than expecting a page of text about what they did on the weekend, let, let alone all of the background issues about weekends often being very stressful, difficult spaces for children that they maybe don't want to think about, let alone write about. Of course. Now there's a question uh, specifically about the Fontes and Pinnell literacy continuum. It says that when looking at Fontes and Pinnell literacy continuum, it explicitly lays out phonics, vocabulary study, writing, etc., way more than our curriculum does. What are your thoughts on that resource as it applies to the science of reading, three queuing system aside, as we know that has been debunked? So aside from the three queuing references, what, what are your thoughts on how FMP lays out the phonics vocabulary and writing? Um, now, it is a while since I've specifically looked at f and I've got a pile of their resources behind me on the, on the floor and I do from time to time sit down and open them up. Look, the problem is that they're coming from a balanced literacy orientation. Um, you know, everybody says they teach phonics. I, 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 you won't find any um, instructional leader um, and anyone who writes any um, programs in this space who says that phonics isn't important. It, it's about um, how phonics instruction is approached or how decoding instruction is approached, how um, getting children across that bridge to understanding how the writing system is approached and the requisite knowledge that teachers need to have. And I don't believe, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but I don't believe that Fontes and Pennell privilege a high level of teacher knowledge about the history of English and how we came to have the spoken and written language that we have today. Um, and I think approaches that don't privilege that knowledge are always going to um, have significant gaps in them for teacher knowledge and teacher practice. So it, it's not enough to have it there. It's again, it goes back to the root system. How deep are the roots? Because the depth of the root system is going to determine how well that plant flourishes. Definitely, definitely. And there's only so much that we can do. I know one issue that was brought up by um, someone who's currently teaching uh, te pre-service teachers is that there's only six weeks in their program to cover so much information. Mm. And I know this is something that I have written about in an old blog post is just reconceptualizing our teacher education programs to make sure that they encompass everything that they need to have. So we mm. have our pre-service teachers being set up for success. Mm. And you know, uh, Dr. Anita Nartschiller's saying of success breeds success. Well, if we want our students to be successful, we need to have their teachers being Correct. set up on their first job so they can be successful and not accepting or expecting anything to change unless they change the training programs. Exactly. And they need to graduate with a level of expertise 
that we as a community expect graduates in other disciplines to have. We don't say of graduate doctors, oh, well, you know, you'll make a lot of mistakes and there'll be a fair bit of trial and error. They will make mistakes and there will be some trial and error, but we don't accept that as, um, you know, the, the main way forward for them to learn their craft. And, of course, you know, there's a craft in medicine, there's a craft in other health professions, there's a craft in teaching as well. But we expect as a community that doctors, engineers, nurses, psychologists come out with a level of proficiency that makes them able to safely and competently do their job to a high minimum standard. Um, but we perhaps need to have that conversation um, a little more earnestly about what we're expecting of beginning teachers um, and the fact that, um, you know, their, their first class shouldn't be a natural experiment. Um, they should be children who succeed, um, irrespective of whether they're, de- they're being taught by a new graduate teacher or someone who's been teaching for four decades. Well, and there should be the expectation that they're covering the same content. Yes, yeah. Now, the person who graduated four decades ago, you know, we would expect just as in medicine and other disciplines that the knowledge base has changed, but we would also expect that that person has been keeping up with changes in knowledge as as the knowledge changes, um, that they would be making refinements to their practice. And, you know, we, again, we expect people in other professions to be lifelong learners. Um, And, you you know, you don't want to go along to a medical practitioner who graduated 35, 40 years ago and think that they're going to be um, making diagnostic and management decisions based on what was current 35 or 40 years ago. We have an assumption that we don't even necessarily bring to conscious awareness that those diagnostic decisions and management decisions are going to be made on the basis of current best practice. So why can't children and parents make that same assumption when they send their children to school or when children start school? Why is that same assumption not a safe one? Um, And certainly in Australia, I think there's way too much variability from school to school. I'm sitting here in Bendigo in central Victoria, and I can point in different directions and tell you, you know, there's a school over there that's doing a really fabulous job because they're on this change journey. There's one over there that is miles away and steeped in balanced literacy. You know, why should it be a matter of luck? for parents as to where their children happen to go to school as to what kind of reading instruction if I was pointing at different hospitals that do vastly different things with respect to infection control that that would be on the front page of the local newspaper and we would be seeing the consequences in education the adverse consequences of suboptimal instruction are a slow burn And we have a tendency to sheet home responsibility for lack of progress to children themselves and to their parents and their community um, rather than to the type of instruction that they've been exposed to, unfortunately. Yes. And I guess one thing that's kind of off topic, but when we're talking about parents and children, As a teacher, you should not be placing the blame on the parents for not reading enough to their child because all of this that we've been talking about is highlighting that learning to read is not a natural process. Mm -hmm. And asking a parent how many books are in the home and how often they read to them, you can read a severely dyslexic child every night, four hours Mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. They could have had hundreds of hours of exposures to reading before they even entered Hmm. kindergarten. Correct. And then a student that had barely any and had huge amounts of screen time, but they pick up reading. 
And we, we have some very high profile children's authors in Australia who actively promote that very harmful myth that reading difficulties are a result, uh, a direct result of parents not reading enough to their children. One of them even has a fanciful theory for what happens in families where one child is a proficient reader and the next one isn't. The, the next one is apparently um, putting it on because they're not getting enough attention from their um, parents. I mean, you just can't make this nonsense up, but it's very harmful and very hurtful um, to um, to parents. Um, that it, it, Reading to children, there are lots of important reasons why we want to read to children. We want them to understand the magic and importance of books. We want to expose them to a world of imagination and creativity and general knowledge. We want to expose them to more complex vocabulary and sentence structure. We want to have that lovely one-to-one um, cosy time. It's not teaching children how to read. Some, some children will pick up, um, you know, certain words from those experiences. That's great. They'll see words over and over again and they'll learn to recognise recognize those as wholes. But that's not teaching the transferable skill of reading of, and of reading through understanding how the writing system works. And it's not parents' job to do that. It's, that's the job of schools. And we're going to ask parents to teach algebra and trigonometry as well while we're at it. Why, why is it parents' job to teach kids how to read? It's, um, it's nonsense and it's harmful nonsense. Definitely. So we're... Having um, another follow-up question to the Fontes and Pinnell continuum asking if it's fair to use that for proficient readers um, or if you could recommend something that's a good so scope and sequence for students grade three and above that is endorsed by the science of reading. Um, can I take that as a question on notice? I, I mean, I think once, once students are proficient, um, we're, we're much less anxious about what we're using, although um, we should still be using assessment tasks that are drilling down on sub-skills so that if, for example, a student is having what looks like comprehension difficulties, um, we, we know that comprehension is not a unitary skill, um, so we need to have assessment tools that can identify um, the weak spots um, that are feeding into problems with comprehension. So whether that is um, lack of um, automaticity resulting in reduced fluency when it comes to um, word identification or whether it's um, a, a lack of um, vocabulary or um, problems with vocabulary knowledge and understanding, whether it's problems with um, sentence structure that are interfering with comprehension. So we need to have tools that um, help us um, identify where the, the weak points are. Um, look, I, I, I'm just not a fan of using um, materials from large publishing houses that are premised on a theory of reading that I don't think is a theory at all. Um, and so I, I would encourage people to look elsewhere for um, assessment, monitoring and intervention resources that align properly with um, what we understand to be the current science of reading. Yeah, and looking into programs that are going to help develop that morphological awareness. Absolutely. And the, of the comprehension strategies. Now, I, I highly doubt that in any grade three classroom, there is not a struggling reader among mm. the mix, unless you're teaching at, at a private school where they screen them out and don't allow them into the school. Mm. You want to make sure that you're not just teaching to those proficient readers and you're giving the skills to the, the whole class. Another thing that I see missing from a lot of programs is teaching kids how to summarize and, and take notes mm. Mm. and be conscious consumers of what they're reading, teaching those deeper questioning strategies and not just looking at those surface level comprehension questions. 
Yes, yeah. And just going back to the question about um, Fontes and Penel, I've just been sitting here thinking, why am I not comfortable about using it selectively? Um, I don't know whether um, people listening have heard the story. This is a, a saying that my late dad used to use. He used to, um, in this context, he would say, oh, it's like the curate's egg. It's only bad in parts. And um, one day I Googled the origin of that story, and it's about two um, little old ladies who were having the parish priest for afternoon tea, and they'd hard-boiled some eggs, and one of them noticed that there was um, uh, that the, the egg that was going to be served up to the, the curate, the parish priest, um, had some um, rot in it. And the other one said, yes, but it's only bad in parts. And so when we describe something as being like the curate's egg, we mean, well, you know, it's, it's up to, only bits of it are bad. But if bits of it are bad, um, you know, if we wouldn't serve up a partially rotten egg to someone, why would we use teaching materials that have got serious flaws in them in other ways when we can go looking for other resources that are more reliable and robust and do align more coherently with what we're trying to do? So I think it's the curate's egg problem that makes me hesitate. And it, it's up to too much interpretation saying, okay, we'll use this page, that page, and the other page, but not the rest cherry of it. Cherry picking. It's cherry picking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I do want to be conscious of time and wrap it up. Yes. There was yep. one, more question, one more question that's a little bit off topic, um, but they were wondering if you could briefly speak to the use about using the diagnostic term of developmental language disorder and its relationship with dyslexia and specific learning disorders. Ooh, um, uh, well, um, many people would know that there's been a big shift in um, the last five years or so away from using the term specific language impairment, which was mainly used by researchers anyway, to a much more inclusive term, developmental language disorder, or the first D is kind of in brackets. Um, so developmental language disorder is the disorder that exists um, uh, on its own without other known comorbidities. But many children have a language disorder in association with another disorder such as excuse me, autism, intellectual disability. Um, you know, there are a number of other factors that can contribute to um, compromised language skills. Now, because reading is a language-based task, anything that compromises the language system is going to threaten the transition to reading, writing and spelling when these children get to school. Not all children with language disorder, or I'll just say DLD for short, are identified in the preschool years. Some of them are only identified when they seem to have a disproportionate level of difficulty making the transition to literacy, even if they're receiving high quality instruction in the first three years of school but they become apparent in that context because reading is difficult. Some of these children have enough everyday kind of conversational scripts to get by and fly under the radar. But when we sit down and administer a formal diagnostic assessment like the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals, we find that their profile does in fact suggest that they've got um, structural um, problems with um, using and understanding language. So we need to remember that this exists in the receptive comprehension domain, not just the expressive domain. Um, so we would expect these children to um, display reading difficulties, whether they are going to meet formal diagnostic criteria for dyslexia, depending on how those diagnostic criteria play out in different jurisdictions is going to be another question. They won't necessarily have a specific phonological processing difficulty. Many of their problems exist in um, learning new vocabulary, in working with more complex sentence structure, working memory problems in processing longer utterances. 
So we would certainly expect to see these students um, struggling in the reading space. But if we think of the Scarborough reading rope, um, their difficulties really might exist across um, many or all strands of that reading rope, depending on their language profile. Uh, definitely. So there's a follow-up question to that asking, is there a difference between the developmental language disorder in the ICD and language disorder in the DSM? I don't think either of those diagnostic systems are using the term developmental language disorder as defined by Dorothy Bishop and her um, uh, consortium of researchers. I, I don't, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think that um, agreed international consensus position has made it, or it certainly isn't in DSM-5 because DSM-5 preceded that work that Dorothy Bishop led. I would be surprised if it's in ICD, um, in the latest edition of ICD, but I haven't looked recently. Um, but the place to go is, uh, and again, Catherine, I can give you the links if you can't find them, is to Dorothy Bishop's open access papers on um, uh, diagnostic criteria and terminology. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And I think it's very important to continue having these conversations about how we can help schools move from the balanced literacy to the structured literacy approach and realize that this process of change is going to have hiccups and bumps along the road. Absolutely, Catherine, and thank you to the contributions from people. I've, I can see that people are um, making comments in the chat, but I, I've given up trying to do that dual processing of monitoring our conversation and the um, chat because I know I end up not doing justice to either when I do that, but I can see that there have been a number of um, lovely comments. And I would also encourage people if they'd like to to. Um, post comments and questions on the blog post um, itself. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening or morning, depending on. <laughs> it's nearly the middle of the day for me now. <laughs> so thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everybody.